Hello and welcome to the Kim Iverson Show. So tonight we're going to be diving into the concept of Zionism with our guest Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro. Rabbi Shapiro is an international speaker, author, and pulpit rabbi for over 30 years. He's written many books, his most recent being The Empty Wagon, Zionism's Journey from Identity Crisis to Identity Theft, which is a 1,381-page treatise on the differences between Judaism and Zionism. And it is the most comprehensive work written on the subject and considered by many to be definitive. So there's a lot of confusion out there about what Zionism is and what it isn't. There's confusion over what the difference is between the Jewish faith and the national movement of Zionism. There's also confusion over the difference between the state of Israel and the people of Israel, and the reason the Holy Land is so hotly contested between warring groups of people. So the goal tonight is to gain a historical and religious understanding which we are confident Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro will most help, will definitely most certainly help us with. But first, we're going to get to our sponsors tonight. Let me tell you about Lean. This is a wonderful product by Brick House Nutrition. They make high, high quality products. And Lean is just a really great weight loss product that is going to help you shed those pandemic pounds. I know a lot of us gained some weight over the last few years and we're trying to get rid of it. So Lean is going to help you do that. By And again, it's all natural, high quality products. So you don't have to worry about, you know, pumping yourself full of pharmaceuticals in order to lose weight or anything like that. This product is going to help you burn the fat right off of your body. It helps target that fat to trigger that lipo liposis. It's also going to help you curb your appetite in an all natural way. And it's also going to help lower your blood sugar in a natural way as well. So these are all things that you need in order to help you lose that weight and lean can help you do that. It does take about three weeks, they say, for it to kick in. So give it some time to do that. But let me get you started with 15% off your first order. Go to takelean.com. The link is down below. And use that promo code KIM15 and you'll get 15% off your first order. Again, takelean.com. Promo code KIM15 for 15% off your first order. Let me tell you about another great product from Brickhouse Nutrition, and that is Field of Greens. So I really love this stuff because it is a fine powder that is made exclusively from dehydrated whole fruits and vegetables. That's all it is, but they are carefully selected to give you the most nutrients in your diet possible. So I know it's really hard for a lot of us to get all of our fruits and veggies into our diet, especially if you're on the move all the time or you forget to eat breakfast or your lunch is maybe not as good as it should be. So what you can do to get all of your fruits and veggies in your diet is you take a scoop of this powder, you mix it into your ice water. It really tastes great. It tastes like iced green tea, maybe with a little lemon in it if you choose the lemon lime flavor, which is my favorite. It's a great way to get all of your fruits and vegetables into your diet. Um, you can also mix it. You know, it's a real fine powder, so you can put it in a lot of things if you want to bake it into cookies. You shouldn't be eating your <laughs> as many cookies, right? We're trying to lose weight. We're trying to get healthy here. But if you want to, you could probably put this stuff into brownies or cookies or whatever, and you're going to get your fruits and vegetables. You can mix it into soup mixes. Um, into salad dressings so that you can boost your salad's nutrition content. However you want to use it, try it out. There's a lot of different ways. Uh, but go to fieldofgreens.com and use the promo code KIM and you will get 15% off your order. So again, that is fieldofgreens.com, promo code KIM, and you will get 15% off your first order. All right, let's get to tonight's conversation. Really excited to have this one tonight. We're going to dive into the concept of Zionism, what it is and what it isn't. And with us tonight is Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much for having me. So let's, uh, you know, this is a, this is a, tough, a, a tough subject to broach just because people often think that the term Zionism, some people are hesitant to even use the term because they feel like it's almost a dirty word, like if you like it's uh, anti-Semitic to say Zionism at all. So can you clarify, I think, that aspect of it, first of all, what it is, what it isn't? Sure. Uh, in order to understand what Zionism is, we need to understand what Judaism is, because there's a relationship between Judaism and Zionism, but not the relationship that people usually think. The relationship between Judaism and Zionism is that Judaism is like unto a disease to Zionism, and Zionism was the cure for Judaism. Now, 
Yeah. To me, Judaism is not, well, here's what I mean. That Zionism was created in order to negate Judaism, to replace Judaism, to cure the Jewish people of Judaism. Judy, yeah, here's, I know, here, here's the story. Judaism was a religion, and um, basically the way the religion works is that, uh, as it says in the Bible, God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, and uh, whoever is commanded to fulfill the law that Moses received is considered a Jew. Not considered, that's the definition of a Jew. The definition of a Jew is those people who were enjoined by God, given the Torah to Moses, to fulfill 613 commandments. Okay. okay. The rest of the world who are not Jews have to fulfill seven commandments. Judaism is universal religion. According to Judaism, everybody in the world has to fulfill seven Noahide laws. Um, not to kill, not to steal, um, not to worship idols, and not to rip uh, limbs off live animals and eat them. Long story, but that's one of them. Anyway, there are there are another group of commandments, and there are 613 of them. Those were given to Moses on Mount Sinai to the Jewish people who left Egypt, as in the exodus from Egypt. They walked to Mount Sinai, um, and whoever is commanded in those 613, they are the Jews. That's the definition of a Jew. That's it. So is it so these 613 commandments, that's how many there mm -hmm. are, 613, that is mm -hmm. only for the Jewish people? Can anyone be Jewish, or is it just the people that ended up there at Mount Sinai at that time? Excellent question. The answer is anybody could be Jewish. You see, uh, according to our religion, our tradition, uh, the souls of many, many people were there at Mount Sinai, even those who were not there in physical bodies. Those souls also agreed uh, to fulfill the 613 commandments. The Jews agreed to do it. God asked them and they said, yes, sure. Now there are other people amongst other, other souls, amongst other people who are not there that also wanted to fulfill the, wanted to accept the commandments. They later will end up converting. You can convert to Judaism just like you can convert to any religion, but you have to accept upon yourself those 613 commandments. In fact, King David was a great-great-grandson of Ruth, the Moabite woman, who was non-Jewish, and then she converted to Judaism. King David himself and his whole Davidic uh, lineage are, are uh, children of converts, descendants of converts, convert Ruth, the Moabite. So you can convert to Judaism. And like all religions, Judaism has its rules. You cannot convert out of Judaism. And remember, the definition of a Jew is somebody who's commanded to fulfill those 613. So if you, let's say, say that you converted out of Judaism, now let's say I'm a Christian, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter. You're still obligated in those 613. If you're an atheist, you're, you're obligated in those 613 if you were born of a Jewish mother. Jews, whoever the Jewish law says is commanded in those 613, that is the definition of a Jew, no more and no less. We have very specific rules regarding who is obligated in those laws. If you have a Jewish father and a non-Jewish mother, you are 100% non-Jewish. Okay. If you have a Jewish mother and a non-Jewish father, you are 100% Jewish. And by Jewish, I mean you are obliged to fulfill those laws. Okay. It's like the best description of being a Jew is, we call it a religion, uh, a better, more accurate description would be a, it's a job description. God gave a job to certain people. There's a policeman as a job description. Uh, somebody may not believe he's a policeman, but if he's a policeman, he has, to, he may never come to work. He may not be the greatest policeman. He may not fulfill his duties, but his duties is what make him a policeman. Let's just assume that. Okay. There okay. are certain duties that people have according to God, according to the religion of Judaism. And if you have these 613, and it's very specific, who precisely has these obligations and who doesn't, you're Jewish. That's all it meant. Okay. Jews came in and still do come in all races. Uh, they are black Jews, they are white Jews, they are brown Jews. Um, they're all different cultures. There are Yemenite Jews. There are German Jews, Russian Jews. Um, there are Jews who converted to Judaism, like Ivanka Trump 
is the most probably the most famous example here in America. So uh, Ivanka Trump, her her parents are not Jewish, obviously, and her children are 100 percent Jewish. You know, uh, if she converted in the proper way uh, with a proper rabbi, she's 100 percent Jewish, even though obviously Donald Trump and his wife are not. Um, had so Ivanka you, Trump not con- so and she can't unconvert. So now that she's Jewish and she's converted, if she did it properly, then she is now bound to those 613 commandments. And even if she says, well, never mind, I don't want to be Jew. Let's say she gets a divorce and she remarries somebody else. Uh, she is still obligated by those 613 and there's nothing she can do about it. And if she had more children with this other man, let's say, who's not Jewish, and that child is now also bound to the 613 commandments as well, even if they've never yes. stepped foot in a synagogue. That's correct. Uh. That's correct. <laughs> you as a United States citizen are, let's say, bound to pay taxes, even if you never did it. You're bound to pay taxes because you're a U.S. citizen. Yeah. And you're bound to fulfill these laws if you're Jewish. Now, our tradition says that the children in your case, uh, your um, theoretical case, Ivanka Trump's children of her second husband, who would be not Jewish, their souls were at Mount Sinai. And they said, yes, we accept the law in a, okay. not a previous life, but their, their souls. This is the way religions work. It has to do with God and the supernatural. There are angels in our religion. There are uh there's God, there's forces of good and forces of evil. It's all one God. It's not like there's, a, there's no devil in Judaism, but there are good forces and bad forces, and it's all God and supernatural. That's Judaism. That's all it ever was. It doesn't matter what race you are, what culture you are, where you come from, how old you are. It's, it's that. That's it. What happens if you don't fulfill those 613 commandments? Well, it's the same as a person who, let's say, uh, breaks the laws of uh, the country they live in. So you're going to go to court, and after we pass away, we're going to be in front of God, and there's going to be a court, and God's going to uh, judge us. And just like the judge is going to judge you, you come in front of him, and let's say you got a speeding ticket, you were speeding. And you may say, you know what? I had no idea that there's such a thing as a speed limit. I had no idea. I didn't know anything. You may tell God, I didn't even know I was Jewish. I right. didn't even know I was commanded. And God, just like a judge, will say, well, if it's legitimately true that you had no way to know that there's a speed limit, you had no way to know that you were speeding, you had no way to know, then I can't, if I can't find you uh, guilty of anything. Although it's a pity because, you know, you missed out on the reward that you get for fulfilling the commandments. Okay. It, the best way to look at it is like it's there's a body and a soul that human beings have. Mm -hmm. And when we die, we don't have a body anymore, but we're left with a soul. And the soul, the, the commandments are, they're not, they're not arbitrary laws that God makes and then he punishes and rewards. That's loose and colloquial language. It's more, more accurately described as it's biology of the soul. If let's say somebody doesn't know that cigarettes cause cancer and they smoke cigarettes, they're going to get sick anyway. If somebody, you know, I heard your advertisement, if somebody doesn't know that they have to have uh, vitamins or vegetables, that's bad. It's in our interest to find out what makes our bodies healthy. Mm -hmm. And it's so too, it's in our interest from a theological perspective, from a Jewish perspective, to find out what makes our souls healthy because we're only going to be in our bodies 80, 90, 100 years, but then our souls will remain for billions and billions of more years forever. So it's an investment in the soul and the pleasure. Yeah. I just wanted to ask another question about Judaism. Do you believe in a hell? Uh, well, the answer is punishment, yes, but hell with the hellfire, that's a, that's a Christian refurbishing of uh, a Jewish belief of punishment. There is no pitchfork and a guy with horns and a tail that, you know, uh, a slave driver like that, that whole picture that you get in Christianity, that it does not exist, but there is a punishment. It's okay. called Gehenna, and it's more of a, a cleansing type thing. Uh, let's say, again, let's say a person gets sick, so he has to go to the doctor and imagine uh, being treated without anesthesia. 
that's hell by Jews. Your <laughs> okay. soul is sick. You go to God. He fixes it. But there's no anesthesia. Okay. And the, whatever pain you caused yourself because you got yourself sick, that, that's what, I guess, that's the best analogy mm. that I could okay. think of for hell. Yeah. Then you're done, and now you're healthy, and whatever exercise, so to speak, you did for your body, whatever, besides the damage you did, now there's the, the uh, positive uh, treatment that you gave your body. Those are the commandments. You fulfill a commandment, that's a positive, that's you know, your biceps, your tri you, you, you enjoy uh, everlasting life in the afterlife, depending upon how much you fulfilled it. And the enjoyment is a connection with God. The way this works is that, uh, you know, God created the worlds for one reason, because it's great being God. It's like perfect, literally. And God said, in a manner of speaking, uh, I I'd like to, I'd like other people or other beings to enjoy this perfection to the extent they can that God has. So the thing about God is that he can't be a taker. He's only a giver. Mm. He can't take because he is perfect. He cannot take, he cannot change. So God said, look, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create these things called the commandments. We'll call them commandments, but it's actually in the interest of the human beings to fulfill these uh, commandments because by doing so, they're going to be close and connected to me. And I can't just give them this pleasure because if the afterlife means a connection with God or a similarity to God, that's in a manner of speaking, the one thing that God cannot be, even if he wanted to, it's like creating a rock he can't lift or creating a nose for himself. God cannot be imperfect and being a taker is imperfect. So we have to actually earn this connection. We can't take it as a gift. So we're here to, uh, just like physically, we do exercise, we take care of ourselves, we're here to take care of our soul. And then afterwards, whatever we accomplished, that's what we remain forever. And although, yes, if a person smokes without knowing if it's bad for him, he'll still die of cancer anyway. But God's judgment, and it's not, again, it's not really judgment in the sense of a judge judging what you did. It's more of an assessment of uh, what you accomplished for yourself and what needs to be fixed or after you're not alive anymore and what's left of you. Um, that assessment is extremely, infinitely just and fair. So to the extent that you were able to know or you did know or you could know your intentions and your actions and your thoughts and your heart and your mind and everything is considered in terms of your status forever and ever whatever we accomplish in this world perfect and with a perfectly fair judgment that's what we remain forever if you want you can call it hell you can call it gehenna you can call it punishment you can call it damage that you did to yourself it's all the same sure where does Zionism come into play in Judaism? Is there Zionism? Okay. Is that concept, that word, the belief, is that in the religion of Judaism? No, Zionism is not anywhere in the religion of Judaism. I, I want to, together with the commandments, also come values. Uh, Jews had, have very, very specific values. Uh, to give you an example, uh, our sages tell us who is strong he who conquers himself who is honored he who honors others um jews do not are not warrior people we never admired warriors we never admired um even sports there's nothing wrong if somebody wants to be a baseball player fine but he's not a celebrity with us uh the only people who we admire who we would we aspire to be are the righteous and the scholarly. We are what the Bible refers to as Mamleches Kaihanim Vagoy Kodosh. That means a uh, kingdom of priests and a holy people. Mm. Think by way of analogy, I don't know, Shaolin monks, except instead of a on top of a mountain, uh, we are in our own little enclaves, our own neighborhoods, 
um, later in Europe, in our own ghettos, uh, about a thousand years ago, the Jews themselves wanted to be segregated. Uh, we are loyal to our countries, but socially and um, culturally, we have our we have a job to do. Uh, I don't know if you ever had to study for a test and cram. Uh, so for that amount of time, you shut off your phone, you you close your door. We have a lifetime's worth of. Uh, test to study for the test is in the next world we have a lot to do and we know that we're going to be around for billions of years and now we are collecting uh the uh, reward we're collecting the currency that we're going to live with forever so we have our own values we we really and it's the opposite of the warrior ethos we don't have any um we we the bible is full of um wars every page in the bible you know mm -hmm. there's wars but the sites of battles they uh, they don't mean anything to us there's no special site a holy site let's say like the alamo uh, in mm -hmm. san antonio we wouldn't have anything like that battles are fought only when they must be fought only and and they're they're fought our tradition tells us through miraculous marine means whichever side was more righteous god caused them to win all the pictures that you see or in the movies of guys and bible stories uh, joshua with big muscles and guys that would dress like tarzan with long hair and these bows and arrows that's not judaism in judaism they were dressed and acted like the most righteous um beautiful souls that you could think of and god fought for them it's a completely mm -hmm. different idea than uh, what you see in the media and what you're brought up with and what this translated to is that as in a society that after the emancipation is how zionism started after the emancipation after the enlightenment right uh, a few centuries ago and jews were allowed to leave the ghetto uh, again we wanted to be in the ghetto originally but at the end they locked us in but as salo baron that great historian said he had a very good line he said the locks on the inside of the ghetto door were there before the locks on the outside. I would add the locks on the inside were stronger than the locks on the outside. There are, even today, there are, we don't have you know, the ultra Orthodox Jews, we don't have televisions. We try as much as possible not to have or not to use internet or to have it filtered. Um, and the reason is because the values of all of these things. Uh, conflict with the way we want to bring up our children and the way we want to live. Uh, again, if somebody wants to live like that, uh, that's their choice, but we have our choice too. Mm -hmm. uh, we're loyal citizens to our country. I hang out a flag on the 4th of July every year, and I, uh, but, but culturally, we have our culture, uh, our values, and they're not the same as Western values. The, the yes, Ten Commandments is what they call Judeo-Christian value, right? And the Muslims also, and, and pretty much the religions all agree more or less on that. But, you know, the celebrity of baseball, uh, of sports heroes, and um, the boxing, and the gladiators in the olden days, and, uh, you know, the strong men, and, and the, the celebrating of this type of thing. No, no. Bruce Lee would never be a star amongst the Jews. He would be looked at as somebody who, you know, listen, he could have been a plumber, so he decided to be a uh, fighter, but it's mm -hmm. nothing to admire. And then nobody would have a poster of Bruce Lee in his, in his bedroom. Mm -hmm. It would be considered, parents would look and say, why do you have this guy hanging over here? That would be considered, you know, off the proper path. Now, imagine this. Imagine that you're now an enlightened, imagine you don't believe in Judaism. You're born Jewish, you're now out of the ghetto and you don't believe in it. You have now full rights by the uh, governments, let's say the Russian government. You're now out of the pale of settlement. You're now allowed to do whatever you want. Oh, this is great. Not only is it great, but you look at the Jews who run instead of fight. You know, this idea of fight like a man. We don't fight. I personally, <laughs> the rule is, yes, for self-defense, if you have to, then you act in self-defense. You kill somebody rather than get killed but 
killing somebody is a very sad thing. The uh, Jews were always proud people. And when we were persecuted by anti-Semites, we were th then we were the proudest. We were the proudest because we were the ones being persecuted and not doing the persecuting. Mm -hmm. And now imagine this. You could imagine that in the eyes of uh, people who are part of another culture, a different culture, we're looked at as weak, cowardly. Um, uh, even the sick, um, you know, we're, we're, we're not real men. And, and these people, there were many Jews that decided that instead of our values and our lifestyle, they wanted the one uh, of the Russian Cossack, you know, mm -hmm. or the gladiator or, or something like that. And no problem. They were free to do it and they did it. They had a problem though. It didn't work. The anti-Semites persecuted them as Jews regardless. In 1881 in Russia, there were these horrific pogroms that even we call them secular Jews that weren't even religious, that didn't have these values. They were, they were attacked as well. Now, here's the problem and here's the identity crisis. The, these Jews chalked up anti-Semitism to the Jewish personality. Everybody would hate Jews. Look at them. They're, they're like, ew, they're, they're uh, immoral. And uh, we weren't farmers or anything. We weren't even allowed in universities. And we weren't allowed to own land many times in places. Uh, that's why Jews always had, you know, their own businesses in the ghettos. So there became an anti-Semitic stereotype. Jews love money. And, and they're, uh, and, and they figured if we're going to assimilate, and we're going to be normal like the anti-Semites, right? then nobody's going to hate us anymore. But guess what? They were hated. And they didn't want to be Jews because they looked at Jews as disgusting. They looked at Jews as weak, disgusting. There's no Jewish... Jews were always very literate. There was... 2,000 years ago, there was a high priest that made a rule. Any town that doesn't have education for the children has to be destroyed. I don't mean killed and conquered, but it has to be shut down. And, you know, in the mid-1800s in France, until mid-1800s in France, there was no um, compulsory education in Europe. But we've had it for thousands of years. N nonetheless, we never had fiction literature, art, architecture. We never did it. Nothing wrong. But this wasn't our life's mission. Our life's mission is to study the Torah and to fulfill the commandments and to live like... a kingdom of priests and holy people. No problem. They, but the problem they had was they were unsuccessful. They didn't know what to do. They didn't want to be Jews. And the Gentiles would not allow them to be Gentiles. Mm. What are we? We're not Jews. Clearly we're not Jews. We're not like those disgusting Jews. We are, we are, we are men. We're strong men. We're, we, we are liter we're literate. We're, we're socially like everybody else. We're not Jews, but we're, they won't let us be Russians either. They won't let us be Germans. They won't let us be French. So what are we? And there were various different answers to that question that the assimilated Jews had. They had various different movements, or Bolsheviks, let's be communists. Jews call Marx and these will be communists, and then Moses Hess. Everybody will be treated equal. The reason why there were so many Jewish communists was because the idea of everybody being equal in communism, if that's how you look at communism, was very attractive to Jews who were persecuted. Um, they figured maybe that's the answer to what's going on, right? Maybe there won't be any more anti-Semitism. Then there was the nationalists. There were Bundists. There were all sorts of different isms that, that propped up amongst the Jews and amongst the world in general and during that time. Then there were the nationalists. There's this philosophy that human beings are really, they're really part of a nation, an organic nation. That a nation is an actual organic thing. I know it sounds racist, and racism was a was actually a offshoot of a uh, it was a the uh, illegitimate spawn of this nationalism, right? Nazi, a socialist, nationalist party. 
And but there, there was this thing that uh, the English men are are not just people who have it's not liberal nationalism where you have a country which is kind of like a corporation where whoever's there works together with each other for each other and there's mutual no no an englishman is something intrinsic you are an englishman uh, you are a frenchman are... so there was jewish nationalism as well they figured you know what what we're missing is that we're not a people we're individuals. We're not really Russians, these Jews figured. We're not really Germans. They won't let us be. Let's create a new type of Jew. Let's create a new definition of Jew, a Jewish national. Jewish national is a Zionist. Let's create uh, the, the Jew. Let the Jews become a nationality. Let the Jews become a people. Let the Jews become a nation, and then we will be welcomed into the family of nations. There was a, a, a early pre-Herzl Zionist uh, thinker, if you can call it a thought. His name was um, uh, Leo Pinsker. He said the reason why people hate Jews is because the reason why, let's say, uh, the French will respect uh, an Englishman in France amongst the French is because there's a reciprocation. If a Frenchman is in England, so they'll respect the Frenchman, and in return, the, uh, Eng the French will respect the Englishman amongst them. But Jews don't have any place to reciprocate for people to be nice to them. Jews are like a ghost people. Where do they come from? Where are they? Right? Now, don't forget, these people didn't believe in the Jew Judaic definition of Jew. They didn't believe in the Torah. They believed it's fantasy. They believed it's not true. But they are forced to find an identity for themselves because pogroms. Mm -hmm. They're forced. But the problem is, what type of identity can they find? Are they a race? <laughs> maybe. Maybe Jews are a race. It doesn't really make too much sense. There's black Jews, there's, I, you know, Iranian Jews. Yeah, but maybe, what, what, what are they? And that was the search. Zionism was one of the answers to, the, to that question. It ended up the dominant answer among secular Jews because the Holocaust came and wiped out all the Jews in Europe for, for the most part. And the ones in Palestine were the ones left. Those were the Zionists, okay? So... What happened was the Zionists said, we're going to make a new type of Jew. And, and the non-Jews, the, the Gentiles, they look at us still like, you know, the ancient Jews, these weak, disgusting, immoral people. We're going to change our entire national profile. So here's what we're going to do. Now, the problem is that the Jews didn't have any national characteristics. However you're going to define a nation, the Jews didn't have those symptoms. Uh, land, we didn't have. We didn't have a common land. What makes the French French? Common land, common language, that's very important. It's common culture. Jews never, the Kurds don't have a country, but they have a flag. They have a common uh, people. They have a, Jews didn't, never had a flag. Of course, we were never a nationality. We didn't have a common land. We didn't have a language. Jews spoke all sorts of languages. I have Syrian Orthodox Jewish friends. They speak Arabic. Um, English, but also Arabic. They're, the European Jews spoke Yiddish. The Jews in Spain spoke Ladino. Um, Jews didn't have a common language. And even 2,000 years ago in uh, the uh, Jewish Commonwealth, when we were under the Roman rule in what's today Israel, they spoke Aramaic, not Hebrew. In ancient biblical times, they spoke Hebrew, but Hebrew was not the national language. It was a holy language. Okay, so here's what the Zionists said. No, no, we're going to re-engineer all the Jewish values and all the Jewish characteristics. We're going to equip the Jews with national characteristics. We're going to make them a language. So a man named Ben Yehuda, he sat down to create what's called modern Hebrew. And he wanted the Jews to speak it. They, they used to looked down in disgust uh, on people that spoke Yiddish because the whole idea was to change the personality and character. The Jew, they used to literally beat up people when they found them speaking Yiddish. Recently in New York, there was a, a, um, a presentation in a place called Yivo about the Zionist opposition to Yiddish. It's, it's horrific. Um, they wanted all the Jews to have a national language. 
modern Hebrew. Now, what they did was <laughs> the one characteristic, the one core theme of Zionism was to take everything Jewish and take it from the realm of the holy, the religious, the spiritual, and make it into the political, material, tangible. So in the language, there's a word that the rabbis used for when there's a rabbinic discussion, a question of law that's unresolved. It's teku. In English, I know T-A-I-K-U. The Zionists changed that. Today in Israel, the word teku is used to describe a soccer match that ended in a tie. Do you understand the concept? There's a word we use when, when describing God. It's called kaviochel. When we say that God said or God looked or God felt, it doesn't literally mean he saw with eyes or he felt with emotions. God is intangible and transcendent. But it means like in a manner of speaking. And almost all the time it's used in re reference to God. So we'll say God, uh, kaviochel, uh, in a manner of speaking, got angry. He didn't really get angry, right? Kaviochel today in Israel means, ah, as if. Ah, what a joke. You see what they're doing over here. So you have a father mm -hmm. who's a ultra-Orthodox Jew, old Jew from the ghetto, and, and you have a child who's a Zionist, and the father says, God, Kaviochel did this, and the child laughs. Because mm -hmm. it means, ah, God, as if. Or they say the rabbis had this disagreement, and the conclusion is teku. It means a tie in a socket. The child laughs. It was made, the whole language, language was designed, Zionism was designed to mock Judaism. So uh, they have a word in Hebrew that describes, in ancient Hebrew, in rabbinic Hebrew, that describes not the legal uh, parts of Jewish religion, not the law, but rather the morals and the stories and the, um, uh, the, uh, ethical parts of Judaism. It's called Agoda. A lot of that have to do with stories about wise and righteous people and you know how they acted. Um, in modern Hebrew, it means a fairy tale. So they created a language specifically so that, number one, the Jews can relate to each other as having a common language. They could feel more like a, a nation. And also, they could feel less like the old Jews. They could feel that a renaissance happened amongst the Jews. A cleansing, a rebirth was the word that they used. They created a flag. You know, there was an Israeli flag. The Israeli flag today existed before there was an Israel. It was the Jewish flag, they called it. And uh, they had a, a culture. Uh, they would try to create a culture. And the last final... Uh, last hammer blow, the last nail in the coffin, uh, they thought would be the last nail in the coffin of old Judaism is getting a land. That was the hardest thing. But they got a land. This is, became the national land of the Jewish people. It used to be, it used to be a holy land. It was a holy land. The land of Israel was holy to us. And holy, by the way, in Judaism means it belongs to God. Anything that's holy is consecrated to God and the more holy it is, the more off limits it is. When a man marries a woman, in Hebrew, marriage is called kiddushin. Because, you know, like in ancient times, men can have, like in the, all over the, uh, all over the world, males have multiple female wives and not vice versa. Hari, when you marry somebody, you, the words you say in a Jewish marriage is, hariat mekudeshasli means you are holy or consecrated to me, that means you are now only, you're exclusively mine. You're now off limits to everybody else. We are for each other and nobody else. Um, something that's holy means we have less connection to it. The holy site, the Temple Mount, Jews knew they were not allowed to step there. Jews were not allowed to enter on the Temple Mount. Why? Because it is the holiest site. In Zionism, it's not holy in the consecrated to God sense. It's not that God owns it. Holy in Judaism means God owns it. To the Zionists, anything that was more holy, that was more valued, we must own it. The land is holy. Oh, we have to have sovereignty over it. What holy used to mean was that land was like a giant synagogue. Nobody would enter that land and behave the way they would behave 
in Paris or in London, you knew that you were closer to God. It was a holy land. It doesn't matter if the Romans owned it or the Mamluks or the British or anybody. It was a holy land. The Zionists said, no, it's a national homeland. And not only is it a national homeland, in English, the word homeland doesn't really say much about what homelands means. But in Hebrew and in other languages too, it's moledet. It means the place the nation was born like motherland or la patria right. and uh, fatherland, right? Uh, and they said, no, the Jews were not born on Mount Sinai. That's not what a Jew is. Jews are from Judea, just as the French are from French and the Chinese are from China. The Jews are from Judea or from Israel in ancient times. And I'll tell you something in Israel, in Jerusalem, most of the streets are named after Jewish characters, some Zionists, some uh, ancient uh, prophets. And uh, we have uh, Joshua Street, or actually uh, this in Nun Street, Joshua the son of Nun. We have uh, Joel Street, uh, Zechariah Street. There's Herzl Street, right? And mm. different rabbis throughout this. You know, there is no street named after Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or Moses in all of Jerusalem. Do you know why? because the Zionists start Jewish history when Joshua entered the Holy Land. So even though, yes, they can't deny the existence of Abraham in Jewish uh, history, but they want you to focus on Jewish history, the Jewish people, starting from when the Jews entered the Holy Land, right? Or the homeland. It yeah. used to be a Holy Land. Now it's a homeland. You see what okay, they're doing so, over here. Yeah, I understand completely. And, you know, I, 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 Herzl, who is like the father of Zionism, he was the one who, who uh, birthed it, right? It was his idea or his, or at least he was the one who generated a lot of, a lot of um, uh, buzz for it back in, when was he around? He was in uh, late 1800s, is Late that right? 1800s, yeah, yeah, he died 1904, if memory serves. Yeah, so Herzl, I know, was uh, he was not a practicing. He didn't practice Judaism, right? He was a, he was born Jewish, but he was not. He was secular for sure, not religious, and he wanted to create this. The story you're telling, I understand it, but I also understand then the desire for people who are born Jewish. They don't practice the Jewish religion. They're but they're but everybody around them sees them in a certain way, no matter what they do. I can see a desire for this group of people being persecuted around the world to say, then screw it, we're out of here. We wanna go get our own, you know, let's go get our own land somewhere else where we're gonna be accepted because we're amongst our own people. I can understand that. So what you're, it sounds to me almost like what you're saying, and I, I understand Judaism as a religion is saying you should be living a humble life, a holy life, um, within these communities and just sort of take the beatings, I suppose, like take it from these people because that's your, that's what God, God wants you to live a holy life. And so you should do these things and this will bring you closer to God. But a, a person that isn't wanting to be religious wouldn't want to live like that. They don't want to live like that. They want to live a normal life and they want to have happiness and they want to have prosperity. So I could see them saying, I don't want that. I mean, I get it. I was born this way and you're telling me I'm supposed to live like this, but I don't want to live like this. I want to live like how they live. So they want to go and they want to live somewhere else and they want to create a home for themselves. I, I can't blame a group of people for wanting to do that. The same with the Kurds. They want to do that same thing. I mean, there's people all around the world who have a, a, a feeling of wanting to unite with their with people of the same culture and identity and and even if it means, and I get it, because what happened with Zionism is because Jews were all around the world, they had to then say, okay, well, then we got to create a, a, a language. The fact that Hebrew is now spoken in Israel by everybody is quite impressive, actually, that suddenly from 75 years ago, all these people from all around the world speaking completely different languages came together and learned a language and now speak it to each other fluently reading and writing it is quite impressive as a feat. Everything that's been accomplished by, you know, and believe me, I'm, I'm a big critic of Zionism and what has happened in that land and, and to the native people that, or the people who, whether you call them native or not, who've been there for hundreds of years before the Zionist movement showed up. But I also think the entire um, 
the what's happened is quite a feat for a group of people within 75 years to create an incredibly powerful nation that is united in language, in a flag, in in people. This is quite impressive. It's extremely unfortunate that it's come at the expense of other people. And that is what we would hope to try to mitigate and somehow not have happen. But I understand that desire. So are you critical of the desire in general for people to want to even go and create a Jewish home? Or are you critical of where they did it and how they did it? Because there's plenty of, All you know, of the, really there's plenty of other land. I mean, there was other options in the beginning for where Israel could have been placed, right? There were other land pieces put on the table saying, hey, why don't you do it this place in Africa or this place, right? There were other options. But the group... The Zionist group decided that they no, they really wanted to go back to the Holy Land. They wanted to go back to Judea, Judea and Samaria, right? They wanted that land in particular that is biblical, there, where there's a connection 3,000 years ago. Um, you know, so it, would it have been better in your mind if they would have picked a lot of land where there weren't any people already there to, to go and then shove out? The Zionists weren't merely a group of people that decided because of anti-Semitism we want out. In fact, the early Zionists said if anti-Semitism would disappear, we would still want to be Zionists and not regular Jews. They believed, like the anti-Semites do, that being Jewish is disgusting and they wanted to purify the Jews. The reason why they took the Holy Land as opposed to other options that they had was not because they care about the Bible. They don't believe in the Bible. Right. It's a scam. They don't fulfill anything. So what are they doing there? You see, that's... That's a good point. What are they? Then why did you know, they choose that? If what, they're not religious, so I, why did they choose that area? Yes, the reason why they did it is because Zionism was not an attractive thing. They now say, it's part of the propaganda, that, oh, we had escape anti-Semitism, but that's not really the motive. They literally said that remember it started in the 1800s uh, which was the best the absolute best century for jews in the uh, since uh, they they were kicked out of the uh, the holy land by the romans they were not running away from anti-semitism they diagnosed anti-semitism and said the problem is the jews and they said we have to purify the jews now the jews most jews were not interested in zionism because really, it's a dumb idea. Uh, you're, you're go, you want, look, you want to go and find an island where you want to live. There are all sorts of people that like to find islands. But the Jews said, no, number one, I'd rather take my chances in America or I'd rather take my chances in uh, France or England or wherever. And Australia, I'll take my chances. Zionism was not popular. Herzl in order for it to be marketed properly, they had to take the Jews' hopes and dreams. The Jews always dreamt of a messianic renewal of the world where the whole, all the Jews would live in the Holy Land and be closer to God. In order to market their bad idea, and I'll explain why it was bad in a moment, it was a bad idea for the Jews in order to market it, they had to re-educate the Jewish people, or as many as they can, to say, we are helping you. Your aspirations for 2,000 years, where you say, next year in Jerusalem, we're fulfilling it for you. And uh, therefore, it was for marketing, Herzl said this, for marketing, we need to be able to kind of add artificial Jewish flavoring and artificial Jewish coloring into our mm -hmm. Zionism to make it, give it the facade of Jewishness so that the Jews would go for it. Otherwise, the Jews never would. Now, ironically, it's not even ironically, actually wisely, when they had the Balfour Declaration, right, in Britain in 1917, where they said they want to make a Jewish homeland in Palestine, the one member of the Jewish, um, uh, uh, one Jewish member of the, um, uh, the uh, uh, parliament, uh, Edwin Montague, he was against it. He said, no, the Jews want to be citizens of England. The Jews, you're, let me ask you something. Hey, Kim, do you look, I'm an American, right? Mm -hmm. 
tell me, Israel claims to be the Jewish state. That means they claim to be my state. Explain to me, am I, in Amer am I connected to Israel in any way whatsoever? I'm an American, I practice the Jewish religion, I just explained it. Do I have right. a connection with the state of Israel? The answer is I don't. Right. I have nothing to do with Israel. My connection with Israel is the same as my connection with China. But what the Zionists did was, they told everybody in the world that we are not interested, we're not propagandists, we're, we, all we want to be is left alone, let me study my Torah, let me fulfill my commandments, let me, you know, walk along the bay uh, over here in, in Queens, New York, leave me alone. These guys went around telling everybody, no, we are the Jews, we represent the Jews, when we're ma waging war here, this is not Zionists or Israelis. We are the Jews. We're the state of the Jews. In 2017, they made a nation state law which says Israel is the state of the Jews, which means two things. Thing number one, that if you're not Jewish and you live in Israel, Israel is not your state. Right. You have, you have uh, civic rights, but you do not have national self-determination rights. Do you know that in Israel, there is no such thing as uh, uh, Israel, Israeli nationality? nationality is jewish they literally mm. they're the only country in the world like this and really this is this is the main problem with zionism or actually it's the first cause of all the issues with zionism israel did something you you mentioned their accomplishments they have one other accomplishment a dark accomplishment that no other country in the world did israel claims to be the country not of its citizens but of people who are of me. They claim to be my country. Yeah. I never lived there, don't intend on living there. And there is no other country in the world that claims to be the state of people that have nothing to do with it, just based on, they still never defined Jew, nationality, yeah. religion, what? And, and therefore, it means two things. On one hand, Israel, they claim, is my country, which is bad for me. Right. I don't need people thinking that because Israel now bombs Gaza, I'm, I have anything to do with it. You remember during COVID, so there were criminals, absolutely criminals, disgusting people who beat up Chinese people because they called it a Chinese virus. Yeah, There are criminals. And United States of America put the Japanese in camps during World War II, right? If Japan bombs America, Americans are going to be uh, angry at the Japanese. Uh, right. Obviously, to harm any non-combatant is criminal, no question. But there are bad actors out there and there are criminals and they will right. harm Japanese. And there will be people who will criminally beat up Chinese because of a Chinese virus. But anybody that beats up an Irish person because of a Chinese virus is not merely a criminal. He's nuts. Here's the question. Here, here's the question. If Israel bombs Gaza, who are the Gazans going to be angry at? The Israelis, the Zionists? No, they're going to they, they should be. You know, uh, never mind who's right, who's wrong. That's not the issue. But who is your who is bombing you? The answer is the Jews, the right. Jews they're angry at. Netan if you want to know why these Zionists claim anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, Netanyahu wrote this in his book clearly. Here's the equation and here's Zionism in a nutshell. And this is why I, as a Jew, uh, oppose Zionism in self-defense. Zionism opposes me. Netanyahu wrote, the reason why anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism is because just like, well, China is to the Chinese, as Japan is to the Japanese, as France is to the French, as Israel is to the, finish the equation, Israel is to the Israelis, that's what it should be. That's without Zionism. Zionism is an ideology. It's not merely a bunch of people that, that decided we want to escape and go somewhere. It's an ideology. It's a religion in itself, a godless religion. They, their equation is what Japan is to the Japanese and France is to the French, Israel is to the Jews. Mm -hmm. And therefore continues Netanyahu. That just as you cannot say, well, I don't want Japan to exist, but I still favor the Japanese people. Without Japan, there is no Japanese identity. And without France, there is no French identity. Without Israel, there's no Jewish identity. You see, that's what they did. They redefined Jews. They told the whole world that I am not what I am. I'm not an American. Jonathan Pollard recently had said that he, rec he would recommend to Jews in America to spy on America for Israel because Jews all have Jewish, uh, have dual loyalty.
Now, that's an anti-Semitic trope. Zionism yeah. is anti-Semitic because it claims that I am not as American as you are, Kim. I yeah. am as American as you. I have a religion just like anybody else. Now, Zionism is also intellectually nonsensical because if Jew, being a Jew, they still haven't defined it, is anything other than a religion. Okay, can a Jew be a Christian? By ethnic ethnicity, can I be a Jewish ethnic, but a Christian by religion? Uh, can I be a can I be a Muslim? Well, the, the Zionists had a big fight about this. They disagreed. Israel's court decided that they have the authority to decide what is a Jew and what's not a Jew. Ben Gurion said that Israel has the authority to decide who and what is a Jew. So what they did was they said they said, well, if you're an atheist, you could still be a Jew, but if you practice another religion, you're not. So legally. If you want the law of return, right, you want to go to Israel as a Jew and you practice Christianity, but you were born Jewish, you're not, you're not entitled. Hmm. You are not considered Jewish. However, you're going to ask them, but Judaism is an ethnicity, right? Judaism is a race. Judaism is whatever you want it to be. It's full of contradictions. But, but if you're an atheist, you can. So in other words, if you don't believe in any God or no religion or anything like that, you can still be considered a Jew where the law of return is concerned. But if you do believe in a God, uh, but you believe Jesus is the Messiah, then you're, you're not entitled to the law of return, even though Israel claims to be not a Jewish country. See, if Zionism was only, okay, let's escape, which they want you to think it is, this is their bait and switch thing. Their, their propaganda goes like this. We're here for practical, pragmatic reasons. What should we do? Where should we go? The Jews had nowhere to go. We had to do this. But in reality, they created a whole new religion ideology that, that, that they sacrificed their own people for this. It's a Nash type of nationalism where uh, th there's, there's a whole people out there and there's a country that works differently than any other country in the world. And the reason why the Palestinians are complaining, the bottom line problem is, we all know it now, and we always knew it, is Israel a democracy or is, is Israel a Jewish state, right? Now, if Israel is my state, it's a state of the Jews, then it's not the state of the non-Jews over there. Mm -hmm. And if Israel is the state of all its citizens, then it's not my state. If Israel is a Jewish state, and not the state of its citizens. When we say democracy, what we mean is it's the state of all its citizens equally. Whose state, whose country is Israel? Is Israel the country of the Jews or is Israel the country of the Israelis? If Israel is the country of the Israelis, you're an Israeli citizen, whether you're Christian, Muslim, Jewish, or other, right. you are Israel's equally your country. But if Israel is my country, and because I'm Jewish, then it cannot equally be the country of all its citizens. And that's the bottom line. Zionism is far more and far less than a way to escape anti-Semitism. Zionism is a, it's a whole new religion. They thought that they had plans. Their plans were that all the Jews would become Zionists and the world would look at Jews as a nationality and Israel would be their country, the flag would be, but Jews weren't interested. And then they had this problem with the Palestinians there, right? And it didn't work out the way they did. It was the biggest failure in the world. So Kim, for all the accomplishments that they had that you mentioned here, yeah, they speak Hebrew and they have an army and a military. Don't forget, by the way, they have a very unfair advantage over other countries in that they actually, they're a country that live to a large extent of donations from Jews and other countries and foreign aid, right. other countries. But never mind that. Um, they, they're a failure because uh, whether you... Deem something a success or failure depends if it met its objective. Israel's objective was not to uh, make a language or have an economy. Uh, is, and Israel's language, Israel's, excuse me, objective, the Zionist objective was to transform the Jewish people into a nationality, thereby being accepted into the family of nations just like everybody else. It didn't work out for them like that. Israel is not a safe place for the Jews. Are you kidding me? From all the places that Jews live, anywhere, uh, France, America, uh, England, Belgium, Israel is the most likely place by far for a person to be killed or injured because he's Jewish. That didn't work out either. So in what, what, with what, standard it would it be considered a success it, it yes they showcase 
you know, their food, their economy and their startups and all of this, but that's just marketing. Uh, the yeah. bottom line is they had an objective. They had a goal. It's the biggest failure in the world. And all we non-Zionist Jews ask is that, you know what? Just leave us out of your nonsense. Just leave us out of this. That's all I ask. Don't say you're my country. Don't say you're my state. You know, people come to me, Kim, and, and they ask me all the time, uh, okay, you're Jewish. What do you think of what's going on in, with Israel and Gaza? Mm -hmm. And I get offended by that. You know why I get offended by that? Because why are they asking me and not you? Because you're not Jewish. And they figure, why would you have to have an opinion about Israel? But I am Jewish, therefore I'm connected to Israel. I'm sorry. I ask them, why don't you ask me about what's going on in China with the Uyghur Muslims? <laughs> right. Why don't you ask me about what's going on in Syria? I have nothing to do with Israel. And I have to tell you something, you know, I'm not telling the Palestinians or anybody, you know, how to fight their fight. Uh, but in my view, the idea that there are so many Jewish organizations who feel because they're Jewish, I'm talking about like, Jewish Voice for Peace and the anti-Zionist Jewish organizations, J Street and these type of mm -hmm. organizations, if, if they portray themselves and they behave, they operate in such a way that because we're Jewish, therefore we have an obligation to mix into Israel's politics just the way when I was a kid, Americans who were against the war in Vietnam protested Vietnam, right? Uh, these guys feel because we're Jewish, we have to protest Israel's actions. Well, guess what? The side effect of that is that by doing so, you are broadcasting to the world that you as a Jew are connected to Israel. And guess what? Right. If you as a Jew are connected to Israel, that's Zionism. That means Israel is the state of the Jews. That means it's not the state of its citizens. So it, it, it's such a paradoxical thing, this Jewish anti-Zionism. To me, Israel is like China, and the war in, uh, yes, the Jews are my brothers everywhere. In Ukraine, there are Jews in danger, and in Israel, there are Jews in danger now, and Ukraine's fighting Russia, and Israel's fighting uh, the Palestinians in Gaza. And to me, they are both foreign countries that I have nothing to do with, and Zelensky is as much connected to me as Netanyahu is. They both happen to be Jewish, non-practicing Jews. Um, but I have nothing more to do with Israel than I do with Ukraine. And somebody asking me what my opinion is on Israel and Gaza is no different than somebody asking me, okay, because you're Jewish, what do you think about uh, Ukraine and Russia? Excuse me, what does my being Jewish have? To? It's an insult mm -hmm. to tell a Jew to go over to a Jew. You know, somebody came over to us in a street corner the other day and a guy, he didn't speak English. This was in, in the city, Midtown Manhattan. So he takes out his, his cell phone and he turns on Google Translate, you know, to send me a message. And it says, encouragement for your country. <laughs> he didn't speak English. I don't know why. I didn't look at what language was. So I said to him, America? <laughs> so he goes like this. I say, you mean Israel? He goes like this. I say, I'm sorry. America is my country. Israel, not my country. I have nothing to do with it. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. That's Zionism. Yeah. And the only way that you want to know how to end, really, Zionism must end. Zionism must end. And the way Zionism is going to end is when people understand that Israel must be the country of its citizens and not the country of the Jews. And if Jews want to contribute to this, and as a Jew, I do, simply because, amongst other things, besides all the human rights issues. I suffer because of Israel. Jews suffer all over because, of, but Israel doesn't care. They only care about themselves. They don't care about Jews. Right. They'll sacrifice all of us. They, they would be very happy if uh, the anti-Semitism blows up all over the world because then they'll say, you got to come to Israel. And then they'll say, okay, look, uh, we, we, we want to be safe and we have to have a safe place. They want that. My As a Jew and any Jews interested in doing this, you must, you must tell everybody you must get this through your head and get it through the heads of anybody you have influence over or ha anybody whose ear you have 
that Israel has nothing to do with the Jews. Israel has to do with the Israelis. Then guess what? If Israel has to do with the Israelis, there's no more Zionism. It's that simple. Zionism, yeah, they talk about settler colonialism and Jabotinsky. One of the early Zionists talked about Zionism in those terms as well. But it's, it's much more deep than that. It's more profound than that. Zionism at its core is the idea that Jews are a Jews are a nationality and Israel is its state. That's Zionism. That, as Netanyahu said, Japan is to the Japanese what Israel is to the Jews. When that formula changes to what Japan, Japan is to Japanese, what Israel is to the Israelis, Zionism is over. Yeah. And the more we the more we could do to change the answer to that equation, the more we contribute to peace in the Middle East. I, I don't think the solution lies. I don't think it's, look, they talk about the amount of energy that they, that they use to talk about one state, two state, red state, blue state, you know, mm -hmm. like the, the, the amount of energy and time and money that goes into that should really be going into how to make Israel a normal country, meaning country without Zionism. Call it whatever you want. Call it Herzlstan. Call it the Holy Lands. Yeah, call it the Holy right. Lands. Call it yeah. Netanyahuville. Call it whatever you want. I don't care. Call it Charlie. But let it be a state where Jews can live in peace with the Palestinians and the, and, and the Arabs and the Christians like Canada or like Australia or like America. The idea that Israel is an accomplishment for the Jews is the obstacle to this attitude. The attitude has to be that Israel becoming a normal country without Zionism is better for everybody in the world, especially the Jews. That's where that's the direction we need to go in. You know, I have to tell you, um, I I've been a, a pretty staunch supporter of the two state solution ever since I, I went over there. I spent some time in the West Bank. I saw the occupation firsthand and I just felt like. You know, they're just, I, I just don't know if these two people can mix. Like, they're just, and the Palestinian people in my mind, I felt like they deserve their own nation. They deserve to have their own uh, sovereignty and, and to have their own, you know, they, they should be able to to manifest their own destiny or whatever. But now, I have to be honest with you, after this conversation, I am, you've, I, I'm sure you didn't mean to convince me, but I, and I don't even know if you what your thoughts are, but I think I'm for a one state solution now, actually, but for it to not be a Zionist nation. I, I agree that everybody living on that land deserves democracy. They deserve the right to uh, for self-determination. They should be one nation, and that includes Arabs, that includes Muslims, the Christian Palestinians. Many of them have been driven out. There are Christians there, obviously. Jews, any secular people, atheist people, whoever wants to live there, it should be a, a non-Zionist nation, probably not called Israel. My guess is if they actually did create democracy and allowed people to vote, that the Palestinians and the Israelis together would have to come up with a new name for the nation, because I don't think Palestinians want to live in Israel. Uh, maybe Holy Land would be a great name for the nation. It's just the Holy Land. I live in the Holy Land, and that's, you know, a great, a great uh, but an actual democratic state, I, I, I've now, I've never, no one's ever been able to convince me, and I've had these conversations for years, but this conversation has convinced me that it needs to be a one state that is not Jewish. This is, you, that's racist, first of all, to say we're only for Jews, and then there's a bunch of non-Jews sitting there saying, well, then what about us? Like, I mean, I met a bunch of Arab Israelis who are not Jewish, they're Muslims, they have Israeli passports, but their passports even have a different number in them. I mean, they're they're labeled as not really truly being Israeli. They have different, they don't get the same rights as an Israeli with a full passport. You know, the Arab Israeli gets a second class citizenship. It's appalling and it's racist and it should not happen. We don't allow any other nation to, to behave this way. We call it racist. And in this situation, if you say Israel's racist, you get called an anti-Semite. But you're, but really, it's like, well, no, you know, you're just standing up for the rights of other people who are living there, and they're being subjected to the laws of this nation. So yeah, I, I uh, okay, I, you've convinced me of that. Um, 
And that is what I think everybody should be advocating for is, is one area where all the people can live in peace. And this would be better, you're right, for all the Jews around the world because the concept of Zion is the concept of Israel being a home for the Jews is damaging the reputation of every Jew everywhere because everybody is suspicious that you have a dual loyalty. I mean, they're looking at you and they're automatically suspicious of you. And that is not fair to you. That is not fair to all the many Jewish people who are loyal to the nation that they're in. Just like I'm born, I'm half Vietnamese. Nobody asks me about Vietnamese politics. No one. No one asks me. <laughs> like, they don't come up to me right. and start asking me about Vietnamese politics. I'm an American. That's what and, that is. And, and Kim, and Kim, this is worse because I'm not even half Israeli. You see, right. they don't. <laughs> right. I, I, that's the thing. I'm Jewish. That's the thing. I'm not even half Israeli. If I'd be half Israeli, that would be comparable to your situation. I have, I have no Israeli blood in me. Right. I'm an American. I feel it's from Poland. On my, on my mother's side, they're from England and Russia. What do I have to do with some country in the Middle East? What kind of crazy thing is this? Not right. only are, are the people in Israel subject to their laws, but when they make a nation state law, I'm subject to their laws. I'm an American. They, they, their law affects, they say they're my nation state. They're the nation state of many thousands of Jews in various countries over whom their laws have no jurisdiction. It's it's there's no other country on the world like that well this is be a normal country that's all and take yeah. the energy and time that people use to talk about again one state two state red state blue state you want mm -hmm. to send military stuff over there you're worried there's going to be like a civil war because there's so much bad blood between the the zionists and the palestinians i don't know put, fine so take all the military power of the un of everybody take all Put a tank on every street corner, whatever you want to do, make sure there's peace. Put your energy into trying to figure out a way how to uh, collapse this country, the collapse Zionism and make it into a normal country because Zionism is poison for everybody, including yeah. the Jews. Right. Yeah, you make great points. Uh, Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro, this has been a wonderful conversation. Really, absolutely appreciate you. Um, I do have all of the links down below where people can get, uh, they can read your work. I'm going to, I'm going to buy the book, but it's a th 1,300 and something pages long. So I'm not sure if I can promise I'm going to get through it in due time, but I'll do my best. Uh, and I, I really appreciate you being here tonight. Really. Thank you. I